Hello everyone. So in today's video I wanted to talk a bit more about lands. So in previous videos I've only covered pretty much the basics of land generation, but there are a lot of other um, aspects about lands that are useful in the way of creating good maps. So let's jump into a sample map here. And I apologize in advance if there's not much of a segue between the different things I want to talk about here. Um, but Nevertheless, so in here we have a very, very basic map. Um, so just base terrain with grass with the land generated in the middle. This is its code. So um, the land is just specified with the terrain type, land percent, and borders. So when we are talking about borders, one of the attributes about lands that I've never talked about before was border fuzziness. So this attribute um, is basically defining how closely the land will adhere to the specified borders. Off the top of my head, I think the default is 20. Um, but when we change border fuzziness besides the default, we can see like if we change it to a low value of border fuzziness, this will this will allow the lands to extend beyond the specified borders. You can see in the previous iteration it was a bit more you know, solid and now it's a bit more ragged at the edges. And in contrast, if we set the border fuzziness to a very high value, 100, we can get it to adhere to the borders exactly. Um, so in the previous iterations it was uh, much more ragged and in this one, the edges of this land are very straight. And this can help if you need um, consistency um, with your particular land, or um, in the case of low border fuzziness, it can help make a land look a bit more natural instead of, um, as opposed to artificial. So um, that's helpful to know. So the next thing I wanted to mention here is, so. When we have the land percent specified at 100%, we generally know that that will fill all of the land that is contained within the border specified. But let's just say, for example, we said we're going to set that land percent to zero. And instead of generating absolutely nothing, it generates whatever the base size is set to. So uh, the default base size is, I believe, three. Let's check that real quick. So one, two, three, about there. And let's um, notice something else about this map. When you're working with uh, land generation statements in random map scripting, um, every land generation statement, uh, every land created has an origin. And the base size is basically a square that's drawn around the origin. And if we're, we keep on generating this map, we can see that the origin of this land is pretty much random within the uh, specified borders. So unless otherwise specified, um, this particular land will spawn randomly within these borders. So when we say unless otherwise specified, that implies that there is a way to specify the origin of the land. And you'd be right about that. And that attribute is called land position and land position is where you can define an xy coordinate for the origin of that particular land and so if we specify um, a land position of 50 50 instead of generating randomly within the borders we can see that the land will spawn in the same place every single time. Now, in terms of these x, y coordinates, um, the origin of the map is technically all the way on this side here. Um, and then the positive x direction, we can see, is in this direction over here, where uh, positive 99 is all the way in this corner. And the y-axis is in this direction so that 
position 9999 is over here. So now that we've been able to define the origin for our land, let's talk about why this can be useful. So we'll put it back in the middle here. So when the origin of the land is known, we can use it to help um, determine the placement of objects on the map. So let's put an object generation section in here. Let's create um, object gold. So what we can do is we can give this um, number of um, uh, as many as we can fit and then we'll have place on place on specific land ID 1 and if we copy this land ID to the land we've um, um, just created. So in previous videos I mentioned this attribute place on specific land ID and I said that this only works is for an object that has separation from the players by restricted terrain. And that's not entirely true. It is true when you're talking about the boundary of a particular land, but um, in this case we can also use this attribute to place an object in relation to the origin of the land, which we've just specified, using the attributes min and max distance to players. So so if we give a max distance to players attribute of 1 and place on specific land ID, we can reference gold piles to be placed with respect to the origin of the land. And you can kind of see where this uh, particular attribute can be useful since this land doesn't necessarily have to be dirt. It could be grass and it could blend in very seamlessly with the base terrain of the map and still be precisely placed. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the middle of the map. We could put it somewhere else. So this can be a very useful tool in the way of precisely placing objects on the map. Um, so let's move this back to 50-50. And then go back here. So um, the next thing I wanted to do was create player lands. And these won't have any um, attributes whatsoever. So um, I'll keep this gold generation statement, number of objects 99. Um, and just so the map isn't super cluttered, I'll add another attribute, 10 min distance replacement of one. Um, and then with that being specified, let's see what this did here. So essentially we've covered this whole map with gold piles. So um, instead of this max distance to players attribute, I'm going to change that to a min distance to players attribute of 15. And what we can see here is that since we have created a player lands um, statement here, that essentially creates an origin for every player that's in the game. So since there's eight players on this map, it's going to specify eight origins. And since this min distance to players is um, present, it has to avoid all of them. And one thing to know about this particular gold generation statement is that it's very generic. It has no reference to the players at all. So if we change this from being generic and give it an attribute set place for every player, we can see that this is going to change the map slightly. I think I have to have a set guy object only attribute also. But we can see that instead of avoiding 
just the players. When we set the set place for every player, this min distance to players will also force the objects away from any neutral land. So, and that's in reference to the origin. So if I hadn't had this origin specified, you can see there's just another spot in the middle where all of these objects have to avoid. So this may seem like a bit of a weird feature for object placement, but there are situations in which it can be helpful and also situations in which it can be hurtful. Um, but um, that's basically how it works. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was how the attributes of lands can have an effect on different player setups. So um, we will replace this object's code with, um, replace the gold with the town center and instead of villager flag A, And we will give the player lands a base size of 9, and we'll have these flags spawn right at the edge of the base. So we'll see what that looks like. So the majority of maps that I've shown examples for in the past have been with this particular player setup, which is random placement. And random placement is basically um, players are more or less in a circle relative to the center of the map. Um, but there are other options for player setup, and one of them is grouped by team, which I've mentioned before, but I've never shown. Um, and the key difference here is that instead of um, spawning all players in a circle, it'll spawn the teammates much closer together than they would be in random placement. Now, without further constraints, the um, locations can be pretty random. Um, you can see that, for example, this guy is kind of far away from the rest. Um, so this guy, this purple guy, and this gray guy are rather far apart, while some of the others are closer together. And we talked about this in the last video, so we can have a circle radius attribute, which can help um, constrain the player lands to be a bit closer together and more consistent. So we'll give the radius of 35 and a variance of 5. And we can see that it spawns much more consistently now. And when we're talking about how close the particular players are going to spawn next to each other, that attribute is, that um, parameter is controlled by the base size. So there will be uh, a small degree of separation between each player's bases, and if we increase the base size, we can increase the separation between teammates. So if we specify the base size 12 and increase these respectively to represent the edges of the base, we can see that the individual teammates are spawning farther apart than they were in the previous iteration. So that's helpful to know. And besides that, um, this grouped by team setup behaves very similarly to a random placement setup. And what is quite different, however, is this next um, method, which is direct placement. So when we switch to direct placement, we can see what this does here is that the when we have our player lands defined, it's basically not following any pattern whatsoever. Because when we're using direct placement, we pretty much don't want to have player lands defined at all. When we're using direct placement, we're telling the game, we don't want the game to define random locations for player. We are for each player. We are going to specify the locations ourselves using um, coordinates. So um, we'll change this back to dirt to have it a bit more um, um, visible and we'll 
Um, let's see, we'll put it at 20, 20. So when we have a particular land specified at a specific coordinate, we can use the attribute assign to to assign it to a particular player. So the syntax for assigning to a particular player is at player and specify the player number and followed by two arguments which are um, always pretty much always set to zero. Um, I can't I don't exactly know what these two arguments do but um, most of the time setting them to zero will be just fine. Um, and then when assigning to player that refers to the player slot in the game not necessarily the color but when we generate this map we can see that the land that we had created is now player one's land and it will always specify in the particular spot based on the coordinates that we specified and um, when we're talking about direct placement it's not no it's no longer sufficient to have one overarching land statement to create um, the land for all the players we're going to need multiple so we can copy this land and instead of assigning it to player one we can assign it to player two and change the coordinates from 2020 to 8080 and then we can see what that did there um, and then in addition to assigning to player we can assign to at team and this particular assignment will assign it to a random player on that particular team since there are two teams in the game so player one is on team one and then player six is on team two and that's one particular um, setup but we can see that player three is also on team one and this is still player six so we can assign to teams there and in so in order to create lands for the whole team we're going to need to have additional land statements so um, 80 20 we'll put this at 40 20 still assigned to team one for the third player on the team we'll have that at 60 20 and then for the last player we'll have that at 80 20 and then we have now spawned all the players for team one and then similarly we're going to need to spawn all the players on team two so we have 80 80 60 80 40 80 and 20 80 so instead of spawning players in a circle we've used direct placement to spawn players in a line so there are not necessarily pockets or flanks in this scenario however if there is a situation in which you want to specify um, flanks and pockets um, you could do something else instead of assign to at team you can assign to at color and instead of assigning to a random member of the team you can specify it to a particular player based on what color they are so we're going to assume for this um, example that players 1, 2, 3, and 4 are on team 1 and players uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are on the other team. And so um, the way that the standard definitive edition team placement works is that uh, player, player 2 and 3 would be pocket in this particular situation and then players 6 and 7 would be the pocket in the other scenario. So the colors would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So now instead of having these individual lands being assigned to a random member of that particular team, it's always going to assign that particular land to the same color. Um, and this is going to be regardless of what the teams end up being. So if, for example, um, this gray player had the assignment of team one and this red player had the assignment of team two, it wouldn't be smart enough to recognize that 
um, the guy on team 2 is supposed to spawn on this side. Since we have specified at color, it will place the red color here regardless of the fact that he's um, in a line with his enemies here. So that's something that we have to be careful of when we're doing direct placement maps. And lastly, if there was a particular situation in which we didn't want um, any constraints whatsoever as to who goes where, we can use the assignment at team negative uh, 10. So negative 10 at, at team will assign it to a random player regardless of what color or what team him, he is. So if we assign it to Oh, at team. So if we look at this now, so players 1, 2, 3, and 4 are still all on the same team, but the game doesn't care anymore, since it's just randomly assigning that land to whichever player it happens to want regardless of what teams, regardless of colors. So if we compare this to random placement, where previously a single player land statement would be all-encompassing for all situations, all players in the game, now we need multiple lands to um, assign the different players in the game. But the advantage of that is it, give us, it gives us much more um, specific placement for those players. And ra rather than just in a circle. But um, we have to notice that this particular situation is just for eight players. And if we try to test a 3v3 scenario, and when we generate this particular setup, we can see that it starts generating the lands based on the previous iteration, which was eight players. So it generates the first four lands as it would and then it starts trying to create the second set of lands, but then it runs out of players because there's only six here and not eight. So based on this, we need to be able to um, check how many players are in the game um, before, in order to choose what land setup we're going to um, be having. So the game has um, checks to see um, different um, things. For example, um, how many players are in the game, how many teams are in the game, if a particular player is on a certain team, if the particular team is a particular size, um, and then for this particular example we're going to need to check between six players and eight players in the game. So we have our code here is going to be for eight players, so the syntax for that is going to be if eight player game, and it's going to use this code if there are eight players in the game and that if and then we need a separate case for six players if six player game we'll put this in else and then this is going to be largely similar so I'm going to base the six player code off of the eight player code and then instead of having eight lands, however, we're going to only have six. So we'll take these first three on this side. We'll take the first three on this side. And so at 2020, instead of 40, we'll have 50. And then instead of 60, we'll have 80. And then 80, 50, and at 20 again. And so therefore we've adjusted the code to adapt the land that were the lands that were generated based on the six player setup rather than the eight player setup. So um, as you may have guessed, when we're working with direct placement maps, it can re require quite a bit more of code compared to random placement maps if you want it to be all encompassing and support different player configurations and team configurations and so forth. So with all this being said, let's take a look at a bit more of a practical example. And in this example, we'll use what we've learned. Um, so basically, we'll use the fact that we can control 
the origins of lands based on their coordinates in order to fix a particular um, bug on the map and make it a bit more consistent. So this map is called Aquifer um, and basically it's supposed to have this uh, ring of water that's encompassing the middle of the map. And what we can see here is that there are some situations in which the middle is kind of squished like we can see in this particular situation here, but not so much in this one, or in this one, or in that one. This one is pretty bad. So let's try and figure out what's going on here. And to do that, we'll kind of simplify the map and strip out some of the things that aren't particularly needed at the moment. So we'll get rid of the terrain section and the connections, and we'll remove the objects as well. So with all that removed, the map looks much simpler like this. So the way this particular map is set up, we'll look at the land section. So we have um, one land that's um, created in the middle here, that's the grass, with a base elevation. And then we have another land that's specified that's terrain desert, also with a base elevation of three. So um, Basically, this is the first terrain that's created, the grass, and then this is the second land that's created, which is the desert. And they have a zone avoidance distance attribute of 15, which is this separation that we see here. And so the desert land is, has no border restrictions at all. So it's supposed to be taking up 100% of the map that's in the entire map, no borders. And then this particular land, the grass, is taking up a smaller section. It's only occupying 30% of the map. So this grass is technically a land that's generated inside of this desert land that was created. So we can think about what um, is going on here more easily by, by assigning a land ID. So this already has a land ID attribute one and we'll give this one a land ID attribute there um, and then in the objects generation we'll take a gold pile out of here and number of objects max distance to players is going to be one don't need any of these other things and then we're going to need placed on specific land ID of one, and then another one with placed on specific land ID two. So basically, this is just going to help us identify the, the origins of these two lands. So without having anything specified, we can see that the desert land had its origin randomly generated over here, and this is what's causing the squishing since this uh, particular origin is rather close to the center, it can start to squish the central land, as opposed to having its origin randomly generated over here, where the central land is uh, more or less unaffected. So based on this, we can um, help this situation a bit by spawning the first land, this desert land, in a place where we know that this middle land is not going to be occupying. So we can give a land position attribute of 1, 1. So when we have that specified, we can see that it's now much less likely that the central land will be very squished compared to, as opposed to not specifying it at all. And go back and see how bad it got in here. See, this is much worse. So, based on this, we can make this particular situation a bit more consistent. And then we can uncomment everything here. <laughs> 
and we can see we are getting a much more consistent map. So even though this map has been made a bit more consistent, we can still see that there's some situations in which the central land can be squished a little bit. Um, for example, this player is spawning fairly close to the middle and he's starting to squish this middle land a little bit. But then this player is not necessarily close to the middle, but there's still a bit of um, compressing here from um, the overall land that was generated. Since it's still the case that, um, that this desert land and this grassland are taking up the same area, and it's not necessarily clear which one is going to gain priority. So um, with that in mind, we can try a few things. So we'll give the player lands a circle radius, and let's see if that helps. So if we give the player lands a uh, radius, so we can see that the players are no longer spawning close enough to start compressing the middle land, but we can still have this situation here um, where it's getting compressed by that desert land that was generated. So um, what we're going to show next is a technique which is a bit unconventional, and it's not necessarily better or worse than what we're seeing here, but uh, it's still worth mentioning. And before we get into that, I want to first take a minute to talk about the syntax of map scripts. So traditionally, random map scripts are set up like, for example, we have here the create land statement, the curly braces, and the attributes, and the end curly bracket are all on separate lines of code. And this is helpful in terms of having everything on a separate line, it makes it very easy to debug. Um, but that it, this particular syntax is not particular is not exactly necessary. Um, if we take a look at another example here, so based on this, we can see that it's only necessary to have a single space between each item. So we have the create land statement, one space between the beginning curly bracket, and then one space between each of the attributes and the end curly bracket. And this syntax is going to come into play later on, but let's take a look at what, the, what this particular create land statement is doing. So it's creating um, a land with terrain type rocks on the position, um, which we have specified there. And then 7550, if we go into this next version, we can see that it created it there. And since that coordinate is very specific, it's always going to create there. And then let's just say we'll create another land that's very close to it. And instead of 7550, we'll call it 7552, very close to it. And then we can see still bit generates very consistently. And then say we don't just do two, we do a lot more than two. And these coordinates are going to be what they are. And then look at this. I think you can see where I'm going here is that we can keep creating lands until we have made a full circle here. And so this is a, uh, another technique of creating maps. So instead of creating lands based on the middle and the outside land, we've created lands based on whatever is going to be in between those things. So if we uncomment the rest of the script here, using pretty much the, the same um, code that's generating the previous version, we can see that this ends up being much more consistent in terms of um, this ring of water being very consistent and the central land never getting squished. And um, you're probably thinking at this point, well, um, yeah, that's cool, but it would be kind of a pain to, you know, script all this code manually. I mean, even if you knew the coordinates beforehand, um, having copy and pasting all these lines of code and putting the new coordinates in would be rather cumbersome. And you'd be right about that. So something I did in order to make this process a bit easier
was I developed a template which could um, take a specified radius and angle and convert that into XY coordinates for the um, particular land. And then using the syntax um, that we just went over, we can have each um, land um, created in its own line of code. And that makes it very easy to copy and paste. So for example, this radius is now 25, but it can easily be 30, and all of those XY coordinates get calculated automatically. So all that would be left to do is just copy and paste this new section of code over the old section and see what it did there. Now that's obviously too big, but you get the point. So that was what I did initially. And, and after doing this, I figured, well, why limit this uh, pattern template to just circles? So eventually this template evolved into something which is a bit more special. And to see what this is going to be, um, that's going to have to wait for another video because I don't want to take up too much time here. But before I close out, I just want to mention that these, these techniques of making patterns out of lands and having so many configurations for direct placement, this is all tailored to more adventurous scripters. Um, it's not necessary to have these kinds of methods in order to make a good map. Like 99% of everything I've done has just been straightforward map concepts with random placement. So in my experience, uh, good maps tend to be simpler maps, but for those of you who are interested in being a bit more adventurous, you can stay tuned for that. I'll see you next time.